coming up on Global Business. Uruguayan President arrives in Beijing for a state visit lasting until Saturday, and we take a closer look at how bilateral trade has evolved between two countries. In today's Biz Focus, our reporter Zhu Zhu investigates the exciting prospects of collaboration between China and the United States in the AI sector. And today marks the World Children's Day, and we zoom in on the economy centered around consumption by children and also the latest trends in consumption. From CGTN headquarters here in Beijing, this is Global Business. I'm Lily Lu. Chinese President Xi Jinping held a phone conversation with French President Emmanuel Macron today, calling on enhancing cooperation by both sides. He said that since President Macron's visit to China this April, we have seen all levels of exchanges resume be between the two sides. The Chinese president also thanked the French side for their participation in the Third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation in October and the China International Import Expo earlier this month. He said the Chinese market embraces French products and looks forward for more investment from French companies. This year also marks the 20th anniversary of the establishment of the China-EU Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. President Xi said that China and the EU should work with each other and France should play a bigger role in promoting China-EU relations. President Macron said that France is ready to strengthen high-level communication and expand collaboration in trade, aviation and people-to-people -people exchanges. He also expressed hope that the two sides can enhance talks at the next COP28 climate summit. The two presidents also exchanged their ideas on the Palestine-Israel conflict and agreed that the priority now is to de-escalate the situation and avoid a severe humanitarian crisis. Uruguayan President Luis Alberto Lacado Po has arrived in Beijing for a state visit. Our reporter is helping reports from the Beijing International Airport. Fresh in Beijing, the Uruguayan President Luis Lacado Po begins his state visit to China at the invitation of Chinese President Xi Jinping. This marks his first visit to China during his term in office. And the president is leading a large delegation. And according to Uruguayan official, the delegation includes key ministers and business representatives. Um, Chinese Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs Hua Chunying has warmly welcomed the delegation, joined by the Guard of Honor. Uruguayan officials say the president's week-long schedule lasts from Monday to Friday and involves meetings with top Chinese officials. He will take part in promotional events showcasing goods, services and Uruguay's trademarks. President Lacalipo is also slated to deliver a master lecture at Tsinghua University. And on Wednesday, the Uruguayan leader will attend a seminar on investment opportunities before meeting President Xi Jinping. The official website for the Uruguayan president highlights the visit's objectives. The message emphasizes the intent to strengthen economic and diplomatic relations with China, their main trading partner. Coinciding with the 35th anniversary of diplomatic ties, the visit follows earlier successful trips by Uruguayan officials to China this year, um, including foreign, industry, agriculture and fishery ministers. Both sides say the outcomes have been fruitful, fostering optimism for future bilateral trade cooperation and a deeper strategic partnership. Cao Bing, CGTN, Beijing International Airport. Well, this year marks the 25th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties between China and Uruguay. China has been Uruguay's biggest trade partner and exporter for over 11 years, while Uruguay remains China's third largest source of beef imports. And according to official data, bilateral trade volume between the two sides rose by 15% on a yearly basis to over 7 billion US dollars in 2022. Uruguay officials attribute the trade growth to its participation in the Belt and Road Initiative. The two sides are further poised to expand trade in new energy vehicles. In the first half of 2023, Chinese-made electric vehicles accounted for 76% of the total sales of Uruguay. And earlier, CDTN spoke to some experts to gain more insights on China-Uruguay relations close on the heels of Uruguayan President Luis Alberto Lacalupo's arrival in Beijing. Take a listen. 
Uruguay has to have better levels of exchange, not only commercial but also political, because for China and for Uruguay, stability in the relationship with China is undoubtedly very important. There is a very strong bilateral relationship. It is one of the main destinations for our exports of goods in a country that we have to take care of and continue increasing and improving the export offer we have today. Time now for our special series, Biz Focus, where we take a closer look at some of the most dynamic business sectors in China and around the world. And in this edition, our reporter Juju investigates the exciting prospects of collaboration between China and the U.S. in the artificial intelligence sector. In San Francisco, one of the hot topics discussed during the meeting this year is cooperation on artificial intelligence regulation. Recently, China and 27 other countries, including the U.S., signed the Bletchley Declaration, a major agreement on AI. This is the first international agreement signed by China and the U.S. since 2018, when the two reached an agreement on unregulated fishing in the Central Arctic Ocean. The AI agreement is significant because it is a step forward for the two largest tech powers to put aside their differences for the common global interest. It promotes a shared understanding of the opportunities and risks posed by frontier AI and the need for governments to work together to meet the most significant challenges. Concerns about the impact of AI on economies and society have grown since November last year, when Microsoft-backed OpenAI made ChatGPT available to the public. This technology creates human-like dialogue. It has raised fears that machines could surpass human intelligence with unintended consequences. Tech executives and political leaders have warned that the rapid development of AI poses a threat, if not properly controlled. This has sparked a race among governments and international organizations to design safeguards and regulations. At the APEC meeting, I interviewed several economic leaders to get their takes on China-U.S. cooperation on AI regulation. Take a listen. Recently, some AI-generated short videos have caught my attention. When Guo Degang, a Chinese crosstalk performer, started performing his crosstalks in English, It will also affect you and harm you. And Zhao Benshan, a Chinese comedian, started telling his iconic Chinese joke in an English accent. You will feel a bit depressed when you go in. Well, how do you guys feel about it? Many may feel that artificial intelligence has really come a long way and has matured. But the substitution of um, human thinking with artificial intelligence generated content has really caused many legal and ethical issues. Legal experts said this could be breaking copyright laws, such as the right of translation. This means that you can't translate someone else's work without their permission. There are several other AI-related challenges, such as cybersecurity threats, misinformation, and autonomous weapons. How can we address these issues? I got a chance to talk to the father of ChatGPT, Sam Eltman, to find it out. Well, I think that there's been a lot of discussion about this. Uh, I think that the U.S. executive order is like a good start in a lot of ways. One one thing that we've talked about is that eventually we think the, the world will want to consider something sort of in, roughly inspired by the IAEA, something global. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not like there's no short answer to that question. It's a complicated. Many other guests I spoke during the APEC meeting shared the same sentiment. They said addressing AI regulation requires global cooperation particularly between China and the U.S., the world's two largest economies. I think that any time you have the two largest economies in the world, both extremely invested in and interested in AI development, the greater that there is on alignment, the better that actually that it would be a net gain for humanity, a net gain for the, those two countries. China, with over 900 million internet users and a thriving digital ecosystem, has access to extensive user-generated data. The U.S., being a global technology hub, also possesses a massive amount of AI data. But their data protection and privacy laws differ. Kevin Alley said they must work together to lead global AI regulation. I think anything that can be done for in regards to aligning, because AI in terms of the development of AI is requiring essentially data. China has data 
the likes of which no other country in the world has ever dreamed of having. Some of the technology in terms of the development of the software is also happening in the US. Mm -hmm. If you can align those two subsequent powers to be able to work together, I think it would be better for everyone. Recently, China and the U.S. have agreed to start China-U.S. government talks on artificial intelligence. Many APEC participants said they are eager to see more cooperation on AI between the two sides, benefiting especially high-tech companies. Uh, the fact that they're talking means something must come out of it, these discussions. In terms of in the high-tech area, there will be a lot more communications between these two countries, creating more um, uh, opportunities, either opportunities or uh, create more things and uh, more collaborations between these two uh, big economy. The common thing that they talked about is that cooperation is the only way out for the two largest economies in regulating and boosting AI development. China and the U.S. are at the forefront of AI development, and intense and isolated competition can hinder progress and create unnecessary barriers or even disasters. Both China and the U.S. possess significant resources and technological advancements in the field of AI. By collaborating and sharing these great resources, they can accelerate the development of AI technologies and also tackle the issues of AI regulation for the greater global interest. And now let's get the uh, latest on the messy boardroom fight at OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT. The firm's founder and ex-CEO Sam Altman will join Microsoft to lead a new advanced AI research team following his shark sacking from OpenAI. And Altman's hiring comes just hours after negotiations with OpenAI's board failed. And instead, ChatGPT has appointed Emmett Shear, a former CEO and co-founder of Amazon's streaming platform Twitch, as its interim CEO. Shear said on X that Altman's firing was a badly handled exit. He also denied reports that Altman was removed due to safety concerns regarding the use of AI technology. He said that the reasons were completely different. And you're watching Global Business, coming up next. China's yuan leapt to a more than three-month high against the U.S. dollar on Monday. We get behind the numbers. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business. Only on CGTN. Chinese Premier Li Chang chaired a meeting on Monday to delegate the execution of tasks outlined by the Central Financial Work Conference held earlier this month, emphasizing the significance of bolstering strategic industries and addressing vulnerabilities within China's financial sector. Premier Li highlighted the pivotal role of financial services in bolstering the real economy. And next, let's take a look at China's financial sector. China's central bank kept benchmark lending rates unchanged at a monthly fixing on Monday. The one-year loan prime rate, or LPR, stood at 3.45 percent, while the five-year LPR was kept at 3.2 percent. Most new and outstanding loans in the country are based on the one-year LPR, while the five-year interest rates affect mortgage pricing. Industry insiders think there is still room to reduce rates this year depending on the comprehensive performance of domestic real economy financing demand, real estate recovery and bank net interest margin pressure. China's small and medium-sized commercial banks have taken decisive action to slash deposit rates targeting one, three and five-year terms. And this marks the third wave of cuts since September of last year. Experts predict that listed deposit rates could see further reductions of 10 to 30 basis points in the near future. The main driver behind these adjustments is the net interest margin, a crucial indicator of bank efficiency. Banks are also tightening the reins on high interest deposits, effectively lowering the cost of bank liabil liabilities. But the move is expected to help to strike a balance between attracting deposits and ensuring a healthy net interest margin. 
Consumer lending rates in China have been coming down as banks step up to stimulate consumption. Zhang Shixuan has more. Multiple commercial banks in China have recently lowered their interest rate for consumer loans. Some have kept their annualized interest rate as low as 3 percent. My wife bought a car with a loan. The interest rate has been lower. Interest rates at banks have been lowered from 4 to less than 3 percent, and they're expected to decline further, which means money saved in the bank will not catch up with the inflation rate. So people would get the money out for investment or consumption. The Bank of Communications Shanghai branch has served more than 10,000 car buyers with its preferential consumer loans. We have been actively participating in Shanghai's Double Five Shopping Festival and the Shanghai Tourism Festival, as well as some hot seasons like the National Day Holiday and the Double Eleven Shopping Festival. We also provide preferential services for newcomers to the city to help them with professional education, rental, and daily consumption. Our car consumption finance has cooperated with almost 300 agencies in Shanghai. The economic data the National Bureau of Statistics released last week showed that the recovery of the Chinese economy continued in October. The total retail sales of consumer goods increased by 7.6% in October year-on-year. 2.1 percentage points higher than the previous month. In the first three quarters of this year, the contribution rate of consumption expenditure to economic growth reached 83.2 percent, six percentage points higher than that of the first half of the year. Zhang Shuxuan, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. China's yuan saw a significant surge against the U.S. dollar on Monday to its highest level in over three months. The country's central bank played a role in guiding the currency higher, while exporters hurried to convert their dollar earnings into the local currency. Prior to the market opening, the People's Bank of China set the midpoint rate at 7.1612 per dollar, marking a 116 pip increase compared to the previous fix. While this strengthening was the most substantial in over two months. In the spot market, both the onshore and offshore yuan saw a significant rise to 7.17 per dollar, with increase of 800 and 500 basis points, respectively. Another the sudden strength of the yuan was in line with other Asian currencies as they track the overall weakness of the U.S. dollar, but the greenback was near a two-month low against the basket of currencies, prompting some investors to focus on when the Federal Reserve might begin to ease monetary conditions. Well, today marks the World Children's Day, celebrated on November the 20th each year. First established in 19. 54 as the Universal Children's Day, the day was established to promote international togetherness and raise awareness on children's welfare worldwide. Well, the theme for this year's World Children's Day is For Every Child, Every Right. And according to UNICEF, World Children's Day is a day of action for children by children aimed at highlighting key issues affecting them from ending childhood abuse and violence to ensuring children's rights and their protection. With living standards vastly improved across China, families now enjoy more leisure time and many more choices for spare time activities for their children. Our reporter Yin Zhengyi takes a look at where and how much some parents are now spending on their little ones. Introducing aquatic species, demonstrating technology used to clean creeks. That's what's going on at the science fair in downtown Shanghai aimed at school age. Hosted by the Shanghai Natural History Museum, the fair featured experts sharing their views and achievements on water protection. The museum says it has carefully designed all the content on display to make it an attractive choice for families. We just noticed this fair by chance, and my kid is really interested in it now. My son has long been interested in animal protection. I hope he can broaden his perspectives and meet more young people through this event. It usually takes us a year for preparation, including choosing a well-discussed urban ecological issue as the main theme for the fair. And most participants find it quite interesting as the fair offers them an interactive experience. 
Many parents have expressed interest in these sorts of events for children, and the museum says it is gearing up for more. It's the seventh year in a row we have held this event, so participants can meet face to face with scientists to learn more about nature, and it's of great popularity. Also, we have other themed activities targeting those who are three to six years old. For example, we have special events for Children's Day and World Book Day, which is celebrated on April 23rd. Besides attending those free activities, many parents are eager to put money towards developing their children's hobbies. Like this art studio in downtown, each day at least a dozen parents and children are here taking painting courses. One training session here is around three months, which is around 4,000 yuan. Students can have three classes a week, and most of them aged between 7 to 15. Also, we have more than 20 students in kindergarten and around 10 who are in high school now. Such classes aren't cheap, not to mention the cost of all the art supplies. But even so, plenty of parents are signing up their children. I have two children here, one is 13 and the other is 10. They've been taking classes for more than two years. They also attend some other spare time activities. Together it will cost us 70,000 to 80,000 yuan a year. Here we have classes for sketching, for oil painting, and my son prefers traditional Chinese painting class. Learning painting also helps him learn how to calm down. Also, China has officially further relaxed its family planning policy, supporting couples that would like to have three children. Given how much parents are spending on their children these days, clever businesses are very much hoping that will bring them opportunities. According to data from Insight Research, China's child population now exceeds 200 million, already creating a market for children's services and goods worth more than 4.5 trillion yuan. Ying Jun, ISIS for CGTN, Shanghai. Now let's get more discussions on the businesses focused on consumption by children here in China. And for that, we bring in Mr. Chen Jiahe, Chief Investment Officer of the MRK Technologies. Jiahe, great to have you on the show as always. So nowadays, if you walk into a mall in any Chinese city, it is very common to see a big area or sometimes an entire floor dedicated to children-related businesses. So most of them are focused around you know, education, entertainment, or sometimes edutainment. Uh, what do you see are some of the major trends in consumption by children? Well, the consumption with children is clearly a very large market. The first clear trend is that this market is increasing. Although the total number of new births is reducing in recent years, uh, well, partly because of the COVID, but because the consumption power is increasing every year uh, with a rising per capita income, and the parents are paying a huge attention to the kids. The consumption market related with children is actually increasing. The second large trend is the reduction of examination burden, which is proposed by the government in recent years. So many children-related consumption and education are shifting from the practice of examination toward other things like sports, arts, uh, interest-oriented classes, etc. So there are a huge amount of new businesses opening in this area. And also, Jiaho, when it comes to spending on, on their children, what do you think are the preferences of uh, the younger parents in China? I mean, younger parents sometimes, you know, lead to younger kids. Yeah, of course. Uh, one very important preference is about brand. Currently, um, in the children-related businesses, brand is becoming more and more important. And this comes together with the rising consumption power. Uh, with more and more income, such as salary, pension, etc., consumers want better quality uh, for their kids. So the premiums that parents would pay toward famous brands are increasing, which means businesses with good brand can make more profit. Uh, also, another preference comes with the national brand. Uh, as more local companies are now rising up, some consumption is shifting from global brand toward famous local brands. The local brands are also gaining their share of the market. Uh, finally, more education is now driven toward interest-oriented area rather than just uh, taking scores in exams. Um, as more parents are starting to recognize that the healthy growing up of their kids is way more important than high exam uh, scores. 
So, Jack, if you look at those emerging business models you know, related to consumption by children, do you think that they would create new opportun opportunities for traditional businesses? Well, definitely. The emerging businesses with children is indeed taking many opportunities for traditional businesses. I think one of the most important areas is that the children-related businesses have brought a lot of opportunities for shopping malls. Um, in the past few years, the, the internet shopping has been rising in China at an astonishing speed. Uh, while the rising internet shopping provided consumers with better quality and lower prices, it also destroyed the businesses of shopping malls. Um, today, less and less people visit shopping malls. Uh, but the children business is saving the shopping malls, and as many education sites have to be built at places near the city center, such as indoor sports ground, uh, music class, swimming pool, etc. The shopping mall, which is now emptied with the leaving of traditional shops, become a perfect location. So now if you go to the shopping malls in China's cities, you can find much more kids than before. And also, Jiaho, considering China's in, uh, you know, encouragement of families to have more than one child now, what do you think would be the outlook for what is so-called uh, the child economy? Well, today um, there is indeed uh, more parents having their second or even third child. And as I heard from a hospital in Beijing, that they are having much more births booking next year, which means we might see a year 10 of the new birth number in the coming year. Uh, with more parents having their second or third child, their shopping behavior is also changing. To make a summary, these parents are becoming more experienced shoppers. They have learned a lot of experience from their first child, so their shopping behavior will be more rational, which then requires the companies to provide better quality and a better price. Uh, also, these uh, consumers will be loyal to the brands that they have used and had a good feeling about, which again means a premium for the businesses with good brands. Great insights. Thank you very much. That's uh, all the time we have for today, Mr. Chen Jiahe, Chief Investment Officer of Nova Market Technologies. And that'll do for this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. Thanks for being with us. I'm Lily Liu in Beijing. Till next time, bye for now.
This is CGTN, China 